town you probably have heard from heard of. It's Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It's where I spend an inordinate about amount of my time there. And my wife will vouch for that. I think over the next 40 to 45 minutes, what I'd like to do is give you some of the history of Appomattox, at least in terms of the surrender of General Lee to General Grant in 1865. And then that'll take about 20, 25 minutes. And then I'd like to talk about a trip to Appomattox and visiting Appomattox and not only Appomattox Courthouse itself, but also some of the sites surrounding area. So I'm gonna begin by, begin by opening the slideshow. Uh, if I can get to the screen now. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. The, uh, I can't get to <laughs> Uh, hang on one second, we'll get to this. Uh, come on. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right, I think you can see now the opening slide. Uh, it's a quote from General Lee. There's nothing left for me to do but to go and see General Grant, and I would rather die a thousand deaths. So how did they get to that point? Well, in late March, Abraham Lincoln decides to visit General Grant at his headquarters in City Point. Now, General Grant has been on a seat in a siege with the Confederate Army for the past 10 months outside of Petersburg. And General Grant keeps stretching his lines and forcing Lee to stretch his lines to defend so that eventually, you almost like a rubber band, you want that line to stretch and then break. So Grant notifies Sherman that Lincoln is coming to visit him and Sherman joins them as does Admiral David Dixon, Dixon Porter, a name you may have heard of in association with General Grant's uh, victory at Vicksburg. So they meet on March 28th and they discuss the end of the war and the major item to come out of that discussion is Lincoln's statement to his generals to go easy on the Confederates. And if you've seen the movie Lincoln by Steven Spielberg, an excellent movie, there's a scene in that movie in which Lincoln and Grant are speaking on a porch and Lincoln says that to Grant, go easy. And this is actually a painting that was done by George Healy in 1868 of the meeting. It's, um, it was life-size initially Unfortunately, the life-size painting was destroyed in a fire in, 18, in the 1890s. And we thought it was lost for, or I should say society thought it was lost forever. However, a member of the Healy family happened to find a copy sitting in an attic in the 1920s and eventually became part of the White House art collection. Uh, in that painting, Lincoln is with Admiral Porter to, his, to Lincoln's left. And then General Grant is there and General Sherman and, and Healy has General Sherman pointing his finger and obviously being the one to speak. And if you read General Grant's memoirs, General Sherman did most of the talking at the meeting. Uh, behind Lincoln's head, you'll see a rainbow that indicates the positivity of the painting, if you will. And the name of the painting is The Peacemakers. And I bring it up only because it, it shows that meeting I referenced, but I also wanted to mention it became a favorite of some of the presidents, uh, especially George H.W. Bush, who would reference it in a meeting with Gorbachev, Gorbachev and George W. Bush, Bush loved it. And in fact, uh, when Barack Obama became president, he had it moved to the private dining room so he could see it every day. He was quite a Lincoln file. And this is a quote from General Sherman. I never saw him again. Of all the men I ever met, he seemed to possess more of the elements of greatness combined with goodness than any other. These are the lines towards the southern end of the siege line. And I'm, I'm bringing this up because the Battle of Five Forks on April 1st would be finally the straw that breaks the back of the Confederate defense. General Sheridan is in overall command. He usually commands the cavalry. And under his immediate command is General Warren of, of the Fifth Corps. They break Pickett's line and Pickett and uh, his com cavalry commander, Fitzhugh Lee, are not even present 
at that day. They didn't think Sheridan would attack that day. He hadn't done anything up until one o'clock in the afternoon. So they were at a fish bake. Uh, General Lee would, a few days later, see Pickett, and he would say to his aide, is that man still with this army? They didn't like each other. They never did. So Pickett does get back to his command, but it's too late to stem the tide. Now look at this. The Union loses 830 men. The Confederate lose 3,000. Now we're talking about three and a half to one ratio, and the Confederates cannot afford it. Sheridan does get a little upset with General Warren and removes him from command. And Warren is outraged. He thinks it's, it's an unjust thing, and he demands an inquiry. He finally gets it. In 1879, three months after he died, he is, by the way, totally exonerated. Uh, why didn't that happen sooner? Well, the commander of all the Union armies after the Civil War from about 1870 forward was General Phil Sheridan. Lee attempts to fill the gap. He moves some troops under A.P. Hill, and A.P. Hill, who had been with the army from the Battle of Manassas right up to this battle, is shot and killed. It's pretty ironic, one, one week before the surrender. Grant decides then this, this breakthrough needs to be supported, and he orders attacks all along his line. Lee temporarily plugs the problem with some other troops. However, he has to tell Jefferson Davis it's over. He can't keep defending Richmond, and he tells Davis to abandon Richmond. And Lee begins his retreat at 8 o'clock at night on April 2nd. He hopes to slip away from Grant. And in fact, he gets a 16-hour head start. What he wants to do is concentrate his army, the troops that are up in Richmond, the troops down by Petersburg, and then feed his troops, and then move them to Joe Johnston in North Carolina. And he's hoping by combining the two armies, they'll have about 60, 65,000 men, and perhaps they can fight first General Sherman, and then General Grant. It's a long shot, but it was really the only shot that General Lee had. He tells Jefferson Davis, most important thing I need now is food for my men and fodder for my horses and mules. Without it, they're starving. Indeed, he tells, Jefferson Davis says he will do what he can. He, when Lee starts the retreat, he gets to a place called Amelia Courthouse. And when he gets there, he sees railroad cars waiting for him, and he thinks he's got his food and his fodder. When they open the cars, what, he, what, are they, what is there are saddles, bridles, and ammunition. Lee has no choice at this point but to pause in his retreat to give his men chance to forage, basically search through the countryside for anything to eat, and that's what they do. He loses a lot of that 16-hour lead he had. This is a map. I hope you can see it okay. It generally shows the retreat. Troops begin to congregate in red of the Confederates. And this is Amelia Courthouse here. And this is where he's disappointed and he has to start foraging. This gives Grant a chance to catch up. The main army under General Meade is pursuing almost in a parallel line. And Grant sends his cavalry and uh, one corps of his infantry south and west in an effort to cut off General Lee. There's a battle at Sailor's Creek that's just to the west of Amelia Courthouse. And indeed, the battle goes very poorly for the Confederates. A portion of the army under General Ewell is totally overwhelmed and, and almost his entire command is captured. Lee exclaims to an aide, there's the quote, my God, has the army been dissolved? Now look at these losses again. The Confederates lose more than 8,000 men. Now they're not, fortunately, they're not dead. Most of those are captured, including eight generals. And one of those generals is General Lee's oldest son, Custis Lee. They also lose some cannon and supply wagons, and the Union suffers 1,150 casualties. So now we're approaching an eight to one loss ratio. It won't be long before the Confederates don't have an army. Sheridan tells Grant, you know, I think if the thing is pressed, Lee will surrender. He sends it by a wire and Grant will forward that wire to Lincoln. 
And Lincoln says, well, then let the thing be pressed. And in fact, Grant senses this may be the time to ask for General Lee to surrender. And he sends a message on April 7th. When Lee gets it late that evening, Longstreet says, not yet, not yet. Now, Longstreet was Lee's number one confidant, if you will, through, a, through pretty much his entire command. Uh, Longstreet also was technically the second in command of the army. This is what was sent, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing. It's, it's not very long, but it says, there's no point to further resistance. I feel that it is so and regarded as my duty, stop the worthless expenditure of blood. So I think you should surrender. And this is General Lee's response, which is interesting, I think. Okay, I got your note. I don't have the same feeling you do. However, I, do, I also want to avoid useless effusion of blood as put there. So before considering, I'd like to know just what you have in mind in terms of your terms of surrender. So Lee doesn't totally dismiss it and, and Grant takes heart in this. Oh, I'm sorry, let me go back one. <clears throat> oh, boy, oh boy, I apologize. There we are. So they continued to exchange notes on April 8th as Lee continues to move. Now, what he's doing is he's moving toward a town called Appomattox Courthouse. Um, the a courthouse was usually located at the county seat back then. And so you had Amelia Courthouse, which I mentioned earlier, and you have Appomattox Courthouse. So yes, there was a look, there was a a building called the courthouse, but the entire village at that point was called Appomattox Courthouse. Right near Appomattox Courthouse, just two miles away was Appomattox Station where the railroad was. And that's what Lee was trying to get to because he again had tried to make arrangements for food to come to Appomattox Station. And Grant has sent his cavalry to cut it off. And as the Confederates get close, they run into that cavalry and the cavalry is under a name I'm sure everyone is familiar with, George Armstrong Custer. He is under Sheridan's command. In fact, probably you could say he was Sheridan's favorite cavalry commander. So that night Lee will meet with Longstreet, Gordon, that's John Brown Gordon, another corps commander, and General Edward Porter Alexander who was in charge of the artillery, but had also become a uh, pretty important right-hand man of, in his own right. And they decide, listen, we're infantry. We can fight through that cavalry. We can get to Appomattox Station. Hopefully we can find some food and head into North Carolina. Meantime, Lee and Grant have continued to exchange notes on the 8th. And then take a moment to take a look at these. This was General Grant's response to Lee asking, so what, what terms do you have in mind? And he says, in reply, I would say that peace being my great desire, there's but one condition, namely that the men and officers surrendered be disqualified from taking up arms again against the government until properly exchanged, exchanged for union prisoners. They're not gonna be prisoners. They're gonna be able to go home, but they sign a, a paper that says they will not take up arms. And this was done on more than one occasion throughout the war. I will meet you or any officers you designate when you, when you uh, in terms of the surrender. Now, General Lee's response, again, remember now, General Lee has met with his officers and he thinks they have a shot at breaking through this cavalry screen. I've received your note. Uh, you know, yesterday, I didn't intend to propose the surrender, but to ask the terms. To be frank, I don't think the emergency has arisen to call for the surrender. But as the restoration of peace should be the sole object of everyone, I desire to know whether your proposals will lead to that end. I cannot therefore meet you with a view to surrender, but I'm happy to meet with you if you wanna talk about restoring peace. Notice the, uh, the subtlety here. Essentially, what Lee is saying, uh, I'm not surrendering. 
But if you want, listen, we could have it. We could say we could have an armistice and he could feed his troops. He said, maybe, maybe we can talk about peace in some form. When Grant gets this, now Grant throughout the war suffered from migraine headaches. And when he got this note, he said to an aide, Lee continues to fight. And then he suffers the onset of a terrible migraine. Again, this appears in his memoirs. Uh, you can understand why. He thought he was this close to getting the surrender. So Grant has to respond. He says, listen, I have no authority to talk about peace. I will state, however, General, that I am equally anxious for peace with yourself, and the whole North entertains the same feeling. By yourself, he means Lee and his army. The terms upon which peace can be had are well understood. The South could just lay down their arms. That was, the be that was Lincoln's position from the very beginning in 1861. We don't need to fight. We can talk about this, but we are one nation, not two nations. And he talks about saving thousands of human lives and hundreds of millions of property not yet destroyed if you would just lay down your arms. And so that, that's his response. So what happens? Lee sends a note the next day, April 9th. And what does he say now? I received your letter of this date, because that's when he got it very early in the morning of the 9th, containing the terms of surrender, as they are substantially the same as those expressed in your letter previously. I accept them. I will. So what happened? Lee was ready to fight, and he didn't fight. Instead, he said, I'm ready to surrender. Here's what happened. Infantry changed the equation changed it big time. Lee learned that Custer is backed up by infantry and he doesn't have enough men to fight through infantry and cavalry. And remember, they're starving. Before the breakthrough at Five Forks, Lee was losing almost 50 to 100 men a day to desertion because they were starving. So he sends that message. And they, at 1 p.m., that's the time that was designated, they, they meet at Appomattox Courthouse, the village, but they meet at the Wilbur McLean House. Grant arrives at 1.30. Wilbur McLean is a little microcosm of a story in and of itself. Wilbur McLean was a successful businessman and farmer who lived outside a small town in northern Virginia at the beginning of the war. The small town happened to be Manassas, and the Battle of Bull Run was fought in the area such that a cannonball came into his house. He was so upset, he said, we have to get away from the war. And he took his family and relocated them to Appomattox Courthouse, a pretty remote area. And ironically, it would be at his house that the war would, at least the surrender of General Lee would happen, the war would in most cases be over, although technically there were some Confederate armies that didn't surrender until several weeks later. Grant gives generous, generous terms. When they meet, they meet from, Grant arrives at 1.30 because he's, he's riding with General Ord. He's, he's several miles away. And so he has to ride by horseback as soon, as quickly as he can. He does again write in his memoirs, my migraine headache instantly ended when he got Lee's note. He'll get there at 1.30. They will sit together for an hour and a half, from 1.30 to 3 o'clock. And Grant gives the kind of terms that he spoke of. They're very, very generous terms. He lets officers keep their sidearms and show respect. He even lets all the men bring home any horses they have. Now, that's unusual. But Lee had said his men supplied their own horses. He even feeds General Lee's army. And this is a painting, it's a, it's a recent painting, a relatively recent by an artist called Keith Rocco. And it shows the room they were in. It is not technically historically accurate in that at no time were all these people present in the room at once. Generally speaking, there were only four people present throughout the meeting. And those four people are General Grant and General Lee and their aides, Colonel Marshall and Colonel Eli, Eli Parker. And that's all that were present throughout, but each one of these personages 
did come in. Officers would come in and then leave, come in and they didn't want to miss this moment, but they did not all stay in the, in the parlor at the same time. Um, I'm only going to draw your attention. Most of these men are generals, except for this fellow. He's only a captain. Well, how did that happen? That's because that's Captain Robert Todd Lincoln. Again, referencing the movie Lincoln by Spielberg, you'll remember that uh, Lincoln's oldest son, Robert Lincoln, wanted to join the army and his mother didn't want to hear of it. His mother had already lost two sons. She had, she had, she had given birth to four sons. Her, young, her son Edward died in the 1850s at the age of three and her son Willie died in the White House in 1862. So she didn't want to lose another son. Um, in any event, Lincoln prevails upon General Grant and says, if you have room on your staff, thinking he could sell to Mary, then Robert will be safe on, Link on Grant's staff. And so he, Robert did join Grant's staff. I believe it was in, eight, in February of 1865. And this is the final painting I'll show you, I promise you. Uh, this is again, a recent painting um, by another artist who does Civil War paintings. And, and the only reason why I show it to you, it depicts the actual formal surrender, which didn't happen April 9th. April 9th, Lee and Grant met and they signed the papers. The actual uh, laying down of the arms, if you will, of the Confederate army didn't occur to a couple of days later. But the reason I show this to you is that this is General John Brown Gordon, who was in charge of the Confederate Army in terms of the surrender. And the gentleman, uh, the general receiving the surrender was General Joshua, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. And what I find ironic about this is that in a war that in which West Point trained generals pretty much called all the shots, the, the surrender of the two of the largest or most prominent army in the Confederacy to the Union occurred from a, with a general who was not trained in the military. He was a lawyer in Alabama before the war, and he surrendered to a general who was not trained in the military, who was a professor at Bowdoin College in Maine. And I find the, the irony striking. So let's talk about visiting Appomattox. Um, I, I think I'll begin by saying if you were to drive from Center Reach or Selden, straight through to Appomattox. The actual drive time would be eight and a half hours or so. But of course, that means no traffic. And having lived on Long Island my entire life, except for the last couple, three years, we know the traffic is. My wife and I, we would always leave the island around 4 a.m. when we visited our daughters in college. So if you leave at 4 a.m., you might be able to do it. But then, of course, You'd, you'd arrive in the Washington DC area, perhaps around nine o'clock AM and you'd run into other traffic. So it is, it is a bit of a drive. And one thing I would say is it's great to stay overnight to drive, not all the way to Appomattox, but to stop in Richmond for the night. Uh, Richmond has some excellent sites, um, non-Civil War as well as Civil War. They certainly have the uh, American Museum of the Civil War. They have the Confederate White House, which is available. Um, also right near Richmond, just south of there, near, right outside of P Petersburg, is um, Pamplin Historical Park, which I'll talk about in a little bit later. So there's some sights to see. And one of the best ways I think to do it, if you're coming from Long Island, is to aim for Richmond as your, as your stopping point. Spend the next morning and into the early afternoon doing some sites in Richmond and then driving the hour and a half or so to Appomattox Courthouse or Appomattox. Now it's pretty much referred to as Appomattox. And that gets you there and it, it works pretty well. This is a view of Appomattox. This is uh, pretty much the layout. Uh, they've restored the, the town um, to pretty much what it would have been like. Uh, it's a lot the roads are a lot easier to walk on, et cetera, but pretty much what it look, would have looked like in 1865. Several of the buildings are not original, and I'll mention those as we move forward, but some of them are original buildings, and it's, it really is a terrific site to visit. 
This is the path leading up to Appomattox Courthouse. And Appomattox Courthouse now, again, that's a restored building. Appomattox Courthouse um, is, I should say, a rebuilt building. The courthouse was gone, it's, it's, it, but it's an exact replica. Appomattox Courthouse now is the visitor's center at Appomattox, and it's run by the National Park Service. And when you walk in, you, you'll be greeted by a National Park Ranger. And it has uh, displays and also it's a short film to view, and it, it kind of orients you to your visit. This is what it looks like from a closer view. It's not a big building. And this, this much significantly larger building is the Wilbur McLean House. As I said, he was a very successful businessman. Um, and again, it is, it, the original uh, does not exist. It was actually going to be displayed again in the 1890s and it was taken down board by board and brick by brick, but it was never rebuilt. And so essentially this is a replica of the Wilbur McLean house, but a spot on replica. And this is what the room was like where General Lee surrendered to General Grant. And it is, again, spot on. This was the table General Lee sat at, the one on the left here, and the one on the right, the smaller table, was where General Grant sat. Those tables, by the way, uh, are still in existence today, but they're not there at Appomattox Courthouse. One is in Chicago at a museum, and I'm not completely sure where the other one wound up. I will tell you what, what happened to them briefly is that after the signing and after General Lee leaves and General Grant comes out, the generals, the other Union generals there all wanted a souvenir. And so General Ord got the table Lee was at and General Sheridan grabbed the table General Grant was at. Sheridan would give that table to George Armstrong Custer who would then give it to his wife. And that's the table that's in Chicago. There are two pieces there that were there at the time of the signing. And those are those vases right up here on the, on the mantle. But that's it. Everything else is, is a representation, but an accurate representation. This is a bedroom. It's a master bedroom. Again, it's, it's if you're at all interested in living, what life was like in the 19th century, at least for somebody who had means, it's well worth it to go to the Wilbur McLean house and walk around. And the whole house is open to you. It's self-guided, um, but it, it is fascinating. This obviously is a child's bedroom. This is another structure that is original. This, this is the original structure. It's a tavern that was in town. It is not a tavern today. But what it is, is it's been, it's been restored, if you will, to what it was in 1865. It was a tavern, but it had been converted by the Union to a printing press. So they could print all the paroles they were giving to the, they had to print 25,000 paroles to all the Confederate soldiers, the paperwork they needed for them to successfully get back home. And these are some other outbuildings that are on the property. Uh, this, this building, a gang and original, houses the bookshop and small gift shop. Uh, bookshop is actually an excellent little bookshop, very small, um, but I, I, I couldn't resist. I did buy a couple of books while I was there. There's other points of interest near Appomattox. <clears throat> Pamplin Historical Park, which I mentioned, it's 424 acres. That's the one that's right near Richmond. And if you want to, you could spend two nights in Richmond because you could do a whole day at Pamplin. They have restored, they have replicated the trenches that the Confederates had outside of Petersburg. And there are fascinating trenches. They really are. Um, also at Appomattox, it's, I mentioned Richmond has the American Civil War Museum. Well, they have a, I'm gonna call it an annex, but it's more than an annex. They have another site at Appomattox of the American Civil War Museum, and I thought it was an excellent museum. Not too far away from Appomattox is the National D-Day Memorial. Now, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. That's in Bedford, Virginia. Also not too far, then, I'm sorry, D-Day Memorial's to the west, about 45 to 50 minutes. To the north, about 45 minutes, is Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, 
and of course, um, uh, Virginia uh, uh, University. And of course, right outside Appomattox Courthouse is Appomattox Station Battlefield Park. That's not a national battlefield, that is a state-run battlefield, but it recreates some of the, it, it depicts some of the fighting that occurred leading up to the surrender. This is a view, oh, by the way, all these photos that you've seen uh, were taken by my wife. She does all the photography in our trips. If I did it, none of these would be clear, in all honesty. <laughs> Uh, this is the uh, the uh, American Civil War Museum in Appomattox. Really well done. This is just one photo from it. Um, but you can see they have uh, 3D uh, replicas of Virginia folk. Uh, they talk about the civilian experience as well as the military experience. I'm going to just move on and just give you a few slides of the National D-Day Memorial because I know when I heard that the National D-Day Memorial was in Bedford, Virginia, my thinking was, why? I mean, that's middle of nowhere. And it turns out that Bedford, Virginia on D-Day, June 6, 1944, would lose, would have more men killed than any other town in the country per capita. In other words, as a percentage. Uh, what happened was the National Guard was converted to infantry divisions, and our particular the reg our particular regiment of the 29th Infantry Division was recruited from the National Guard in Virginia, and one of the companies, Company A, was from Bedford, Virginia, and they would lose 34 men uh, out of a total of 50 on D-Day, and then subsequently in the campaign in Normandy, and so. This has become the National D-Day Memorial. It was uh, dedicated by President George W. Bush in the uh, earlier in this century. And it really is a remarkable place to visit. I can't, rec I, I can't say enough good things about it. This is the, the actual memorial. Uh, now, we, we were there in early March. And so, uh, as the docent said to us, you have to come back in the spring and summer when everything's green and there are flowers and there's water, and because it actually got, got down to freezing one, one evening, and they put water in at the site. And, and this is what it depicts. It actually depicts the landing of D, on D-Day. These are troops. This is a beach. This is meant to be the water uh, uh, leading up to the beach. As I said, it wasn't filled with water here, but it is filled with water if you go in the warmer weather. The statues are remarkable. They are so well done, including a depiction of the uh, first army rangers attacking Point du Hoc in, on, at, outside of Omaha Beach on D-Day. Again, a remarkable piece of work. And if you do go to the National D-Day Memorial, this is a restaurant right near there. And it was recommended to us. We actually asked uh, the dose that we were with, you know, we're here, we're here, it's almost lunchtime. We'd like to get some lunch. And they said, yeah, there's no other place to go but the station lounge. And that may have been true, literally, I don't know, but it was a fantastic meal. And that's the inside of the station lounge. It, it so impressed us that we took some pictures. The owner actually came up to us uh, and he's, he asked us if he'd ever been there before. We said, no, he said, well, it's his tradition that if you're visiting for the first time or having a meal for the first time, uh, he will provide a piece of cheesecake on the house because his daughter bakes them. So it really is a great place to eat. So where do you stay in Appomattox? Well, there aren't a lot of places within Appomattox itself. There's Appomattox Inn and Suites, which is uh, where we stayed, and I do recommend it. It was a very, very uh, nice hotel. Also present are several bed and breakfasts. Uh, the first one I have here is the Babcock House, and I have that one down because they also, you can go there for a meal, for dinner. And it, I heard very good things about it. Unfortunately, it wasn't open in early March. Again, 
an, another uh, reason perhaps to go in a slightly warmer wet. If you went now, it would be open. There's also uh, another bed and breakfast along Acre of Appomattox, another one that got very high reviews. And finally, another one. There's also a Super 8 hotel, if you're more comfortable with, um, again, it looked fine. We did not stay there though. And there's a budget in which we did not stay in. So, that, and that's about it for Appomattox. You could stay in Richmond. You could drive there and then go back to Richmond. There are other options, but uh, we stayed at Appomattox in a suites. Where to eat in Appomattox? Well, other than the Babcock house, there's also the rail yard restaurant, <clears throat> which is again, right nearby. I say nearby because, again, remember Appomattox Courthouse and Appomattox Station were two separate towns at the time. Now it's kind of one town, but essentially when you're visiting Appomattox Courthouse and, and the Appomattox Inn and Suite is right outside the courthouse and the museum. But to get to a, some of these other places, you would drive a mile or two, that's all. There's also Granny B's Restaurant, the Appomattox uh, Station, and then, I can't tell you how many quick food places there are. Uh, if you want Chinese food, you can get it. You want pizza, you can get it. You want McDonald's, you can get it. I think there's a Wendy's, there's a, several other places. So it's always an option, another uh, um, budget way to eat, so to speak. I want to end with the map of Virginia, just to give you a sense, because I, I mentioned several places. And if you really, if you have the time, if you had, say, a week, and you wanted to do something, and it doesn't have to all be Civil War related, although it could be if you wanted to. This, the strategy I would recommend is go down to Richmond and then and do Richmond, including Pamplin Historical Park. There are also some battlefields just to the east of Richmond where the Seven Days Battles were fought. And then from Richmond, you head over to Appomattox, which is right here. You can stay in Appomattox also. And then, um, for mathematics, Bedford is right over here, and Monticello in Charlottesville is up this way. So one way to do it is if you stay in Appomattox, you do the Appomattox Courthouse. So you've done Richmond, maybe two nights. Go to Appomattox, you do that at night, maybe two nights. Actually, you, you would do it two nights because one, at least, because then one day you drive up to Charlottesville, again, about an hour, and that, that's where you see Monticello, which you could spend a day at, actually, if you wanted to. Um, there's also, as I said, uh, Virginia University, the University of Virginia is there. Um, from Appomattox, you can, you can go to Bedford, and from Bedford, you can complete your week, if you have a week, by heading again to the west and getting on the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is a beautiful ride. It's Route 81 is the interstate you could go on, and that's the quick way. Speed limit is 70, you can, you can get there, and you might want to do that. But if you go up to the Blue Ridge Parkway, speed limit's only 55, but it, it is, a, you're overlooking the Shenandoah Valley all the way up. The Blue Ridge ends right around 66. And then from there, you can go on 81 to get home by shooting through Pennsylvania, or you can shoot down 70, 66 into Washington and then up 95. You got either way you can go. And it works. It's, it's really a nice vacation. And again, it doesn't have to all be Civil War, but it can be if you wanted to. If you didn't want to do the Blue Ridge Parkway, you go up the Shenandoah Valley. There are any number of sites Civil War related you can see, including, of course, Lexington, where Stonewall Jackson is buried and where, so, where Virginia Military Institute is, as well as Washington and Lee University. That's where General Lee spent the last five years of his life. Uh, he was president of the university. And then there are some other battlefields along the way. Okay, I think I made my commitment seven, you know, it's just about 740. So I'll open it to any questions that anyone has.
Yes, yes, uh, you can still hear me, I assume. Yes, indeed, I did do workshops at Ali. Um, uh, I, I absolutely, I, when, when we relocated here, I, I, other than my friends and, and my family, that's probably what I was gonna miss the most. And I do miss it, I miss it a lot, although I keep in touch with some of the people there. I did, I think, five Civil War workshops over a period of five semesters. And I did a workshop on World War II in the Pacific, and I did a workshop on bioterrorism. Very much enjoyed them all. I just saw the name, Steve. How good to hear from you, <laughs> rather remotely. Let me say, um, if you come into Gettysburg, go to the visitors, uh, go, go to the foundation desk. And if I'm there, just ask for Rich Meyer. And if I'm there, I'd be happy to show you around a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not there. I'm only there, well, at most two times a week. But uh, I volunteer there on a regular basis, and I love it. Great. All right, so if no one has any more questions, we may conclude for tonight. Thank you, Rich, once again. Thank you, I, I enjoyed uh... I enjoyed it very much. Thank you and hope to see you soon. You bet. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.